tarantula enjoys fine gum. Was that a real one or did you make that up for Halloween? No. Well, that actually works, but it's a real one. The tarantula enjoys fine gum. I don't like it. <laughs> Welcome to Folly Ado, the podcast where we rate and rant about all things spooky. But really, it's it's, it's just movies. It's just movies. It's just movies. <laughs> And uh, so, welcome to the show. Um, as always, here with me is Jessica. Jessica, and I'm Rob. <laughs> A little bit different this 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 episode. <laughs> we uh, we spun our random movie generator of spooky movies. We did our spooky spins. Spooky spins, and um, what was the movie that we we uh, landed on? Hounds of Love. Hounds of Love. Hounds of Love is the first movie that technically isn't a horror movie, but is a thriller and crime and drama. I guess first initial thoughts, what did you think of Hounds of Love? For what it was, I liked it. Mm -hmm. What is it? (laughs) It was very very creepy, but it's creepy because it's based on a true story um, and we'll get into the plot, but it's... It has a much more realistic feel than I think a lot of the other spooky movies that we watch. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I liked it. I don't know if I'll watch it again, but I think the way they did it, I, the way they told the story, I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. I actually, it's funny because I put a note and I said the same thing where I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to want to watch this again. And there's particularly a reason why within the movie that I was yeah. like, I think I'm done. I'd recommend it to certain people, but not everyone. Yeah. It's um, a triggering movie. So for those who haven't seen it, just go see it. That'll make this podcast a lot a lot uh, easier to listen to. But if you don't care, the plot is set in 1987. Vicky Maloney is, a, is randomly abducted from a suburban street by a disturbed couple in Perth, Australia. She observes the dynamic between her captors, and she quickly realizes she must drive a wedge between them if she is to survive. Did you write that? I did not write that yeah, at all. Like no, you. that doesn't sound like me at all. No. Do you think she observed the captors and realized she must try to wedge a gap between the two? You can definitely tell in the movie that she is very observant, mm-hmm. just the way the camera pans around. But yeah, I would say in a way she tries to drive a wedge between them. I think she really is just trying to humanize herself to the woman, mm-hmm. especially. Yeah. My initial thoughts, it's kind of like I said, I, I I don't know if I'll watch it again, but I do think that the like kind of the raw, gritty nature of it was interesting to watch, as well as some of the serial killer-esque tendencies that they give um, mm-hmm. one of the captors was interesting to see, and some of the little the little things about him that made him and the couple themselves, I think was interesting, but I still think that there's some things that I felt was a little odd. So- I think overall, I I enjoyed it to a point, and then I'm like, I can go without it at the same time too, mm. if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. We'll go a little bit more into what we did and didn't like, but so before we get too far into it, the uh, director is Ben Young. He's an actor turned director, so he was on several different TV shows and um, small television or small uh, movie roles. Um, in the early 2000s, if not late. And then he kind of just switched over to being more in that directorial role to which he kind of picked up on this. And um, the cast themselves, this is an Australian production, obviously. So um, most, if not all of the cast is from Australia. So when I was looking at some of their prior experience, a lot of them were like TV shows, and other Australian movies that I've honestly have never seen. Um, so they're probably more like independent movies. And so you have Ashley Cummings, who was Vicky. You have Emma Booth, who was Evelyn. Mm. I don't know if it's Stephen or Stephen Curry, not the basketball player, but the um, John, the other the uh, husband. Uh, the husband. And then Susie Porter, which I think is Maggie, the mom. Mm. So like we said, the setting is in. Perth, Australia, which is already kind of spooky because we know like there's so much shit that happens. There's in so Perth. much. It's so dangerous. <laughs> it's so dangerous. You walk outside and you're already If the elements don't kill you, the people will. Absolutely. So some of the fun facts about the movie. Do I want to get into that now? 
or should I go after kind of what we thought? Let's get into it. Wow. Okay. The movie is based on a 1986 uh, Perth case when a 17 year old, she arrived at a police station having escaped from the kidnappers that morning. And then she described the whole scene, including them kidnapping them or her. And uh, she was able to remember one of their names after reading the sleeping pills, which they made prevalent in the movie, but it wasn't as important in the sense of um, maybe, I guess, I guess maybe near the ending where it, in the movie, they focused more on like the address as a hint that mm-hmm. she could give versus not, their, a, not, not so much their names. Not so much and, their names. Um, so uh, she, she read out the name uh, Stephen Birdie and the police had, uh, um, I'm trying to blank. Holy they shit. had a profile on him already or they knew of him or no. So they, they captured him and then he led them to the series of graves mm. in the national park. So, which was in the movie as well. Um, I just didn't realize that was a national park. It just like was it a full looks, wall of yeah. trees in a wallop of trees, a wallop of trees where he proved to have abducted and raped and killed four other women all within a five week period in 1986. So, and because I know some of this actual like story too, is that the like weirdest thing is that it's a couple doing this together. Right. right. So, um, I'm not, I don't know if they're married or if they were just together, but they would basically hunt for their victims mm-hmm. together and trick them into thinking, like, oh, well, we're just a couple. We have a little car seat in the back and mm-hmm. like gain their trust that way. And then, from what I remember, from what I've like heard of the story is that the um, victim who escaped, who went to the police, she had to kind of prove to them that, no, I was abducted. And she had left like little earrings or like little bits and of her of own. like lipstick and stuff like that of her own belongings around the house to try and leave a trail in case she did die. And then sure. someone could find it. Yeah, that's smart. Yes, it is. Yes. Um, so uh, both of them were captured and then sentenced to uh, life in prison where he ended up killing himself in 2005. And then his wife, Catherine, still remains incarcerated. God, Um, I hope she's in pain. (laughs) Yeah, I do too. The director said that he drew on accounts of nine separate murder couples in the script while developing it. So he wanted to explore the psychological dependencies that lead female killers to assist their partners in murder. It's such a weird concept. You usually Mm -hmm. hear about serial killers or serial rapists that work on their own but as a couple yeah. you find these two psychopaths that just have this weird fucking chemistry yeah and there was um I, I kept feeling like the movie wanted you to sympathize with her because she had several moments where she's kind of to herself and she's staring off in the distance and obviously she's not happy in this relationship either and she gets a lot of screen time like she gets more screen time than than john does i don't i don't really feel as if the movie was trying to have the audience sympathize with her or if they were just trying to more give an explanation for what motivates her and what kind of how it ties up the end of the movie. Right. Um, I mean, I do definitely I think that the movie focused on him being the main villain, mm-hmm. but I don't, I don't I guess I didn't really feel like she was as sympathetic. I think it for me, it just felt more like she was this was an explanation for why she was doing what she was doing. Yeah, I don't know. I I just got that. Yeah, no, yeah. Feeling. I mean, it, I think just, I don't think that's a ridiculous yeah. statement. I think that yeah, you can you definitely can look at it that way if you want. So the way that <laughs> if you want to think that way, um, I'm going to go into general notes, and then I have some other little nuggets that I have of trivia that I can throw in there. But um, overall, I thought the performances were, I thought they were pretty good. I thought they were really good. Yeah, I thought Evelyn was very good within her role as well. Mm -hmm. And she actually won an award. I think she was the only one that actually won an award for her performance. Mm -hmm. Um, Some Australian award, I'm not really sure. That doesn't matter to us. If anyone is listening to this podcast and is from Australia, let us know about the awards because I have no idea. God bless you. God bless. (laughs) One thing I did want to point out with Vicky that kind of hit me Mm -hmm. was, so she had snuck out of the house. They abduct her by picking her up and offering her we so for a weed. party she's going to yeah. and just kind of the thing like, oh, we'll give you a ride, but we we have to pick something up first. Right. So then they do what they can to get her back or to their house. Once mm-hmm. they get to the house, eventually she does. She accepts a drink and they spike her drink to which she starts realizing everything. And they already know that they have her. So they're playing with her at this point. And she's slowly trying to get out of the house, but she can't. She's starting to lose conscious consciousness. And it was the point in which... Um, 
they both kind of surround her. And at that point, she just crumbles on the floor and just starts crying. It was that point where I was like, holy shit, like that. I Because I, it to me, it was like, I wonder if that's what it's like for those that have been in that situation. Like, I'm just what what like the, well, it's almost like i just can't physically yeah, she if can, she's, but... yeah if she's drugged she's definitely i mean i think they're trying to show that mentally she was registering what was yeah, happening exactly. to her yeah right. so then physically she and at that point if you're drugged you're just kind of collapsing and watching yep. this happen until you literally like pass out so i think yeah that was a really terrifying moment right knowing that there's just nothing she can do mm-hmm. and i i really like that moment because i was that's where it really hit. And then they continue with like these longer form shots where they're chaining her together and mm-hmm. stuff. And I actually, uh, I know you know this, but I, I really enjoy longer shots like that too, rather than just like quick cuts, you know, looking at the chain, yeah. look at how dirty the chain is, blah, blah, blah. But overall, did you think aesthetically they captured the 80s? Did it feel like the 80s? Yeah, I mean, I... I... I feel like there's movies where they're like, no, it's the 80s. And you're like, I just... This movie is trying to be back into yeah. that time, and I'm I'm sure it's like really hard for them just to stay as you know um, to the to the T. Mm-hmm. But I, I I thought they did a pretty good job. I think they did. Part of me feels like Perth still looks like that anyway, so maybe it was <laughs> really easy for them to do it. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. And then they they also had like filters. They yep. used some pretty some light, some heavy filters, mm-hmm. um, which I think worked. And then I have a note for blood. We're Ugh. fans of blood in the sense that, like, I'm we super. We want realistic blood. I, it's got to be realistic, and if it's not, it should work with the movie that it's in. Yeah. Right. So I thought the blood was pretty good in this movie. It seemed pretty mm-hmm. realistic. There wasn't anything too crazy they did with the blood. There weren't a lot of very gory scenes. Thank God. Yeah. Um. There was a lot of implied kind of torture. There was and... a lot of implied torture and violence, mm-hmm. which, especially for this subject, I, I really hate, and I. I know it's a crazy statement to make, but I hate rape scenes. What? You do? I know, right? Huh. Yeah. Well. I know. Um, but so, yeah. and there, this was a story based around serial rapists, mm-hmm. and they didn't show any of that kind of graphic content directly. Right. It was all implied. Right. So you would have shots of, you know, her screaming and the door shutting mm-hmm. and them with their kind of like tools and everything like that and then it would cut to you know her the next day just basically broken and Mm -hmm. bruised and bloody and everything like that and for me it was still i was still terrified watching the movie so i really (laughs) you know hats off to you for doing that i mean i I was watching you kind of cringing with a Mm. a good amount of the scenes too Mm -hmm. so it definitely was tense um it definitely had its tense moments i think Um, it delivered what it was trying to deliver um this there were slow motion shots that they were doing right away when they were kind of introducing our abductors Mm -hmm. um watching teenage girls just they're out what did they call it net netball what oh netball yeah it's my my australian no it sounds like you're saying nipple (laughs) nipple nipple and then it made me think because they kept doing these shots so it made me wonder if and it it might just be me but just the thought that they were having these slow motion shots because from the captees standpoint, every second feels like an eternity. So um, when they do these slow motion shots of people doing normal things, it's, you know, kind of uh, taking you into the mindset of right. of Vicky and her torture and stuff like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that's interesting. I think, too, what I really liked about the slow motion shots is that it seemed that the camera was panning at a regular pace maybe like slightly slowed down but the actual action in the shots where like you have kids jump roping or people starting up their lawnmower that was really slowed down so kind of Mm -hmm. which i really i liked that difference instead of just like a very slow panning thing or you're just the camera's just stationary and focused on one action the camera's panning right in a Kind of like the guy that was mowing his lawn. That the dirt lawn. The, it was just what dirt. are you gonna mow? Yeah. And the, you're in Australia. What you know? It's everything's just dried it. out. Just leave it. It's gonna die. Yeah. Um, and then uh, some of the other things I want to note too is just the ambiance and the music. Um, so I, I have a hard time with it just because sometimes I just forget to pay attention to the music or or anything like that. Essentially, it was just very unsettling. I think um, for the most part, the they did a good job with the music. Mm-hmm. Um, and during this whole 
uh, movie and plot, this was taking place apparently during like Christmas time. So, and I, I told Rob this and I've said this multiple times. I hate Christmas. <laughs> so, and especially Christmas music. I was talking with my Halloween's friends. Halloween's where it's at. Yeah. But I was talking with my friends the other day and they're like, what's your favorite Christmas music? Or like, if you had to choose between like this shitty Christmas song and this one, which would you choose? And I said, I hate all Christmas yeah. music except for Muppets Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> So the fact that they're playing Christmas music during some of these terrifying moments yeah. just solidifies my hatred for Christmas. Well, we also pointed out too, like, they're not even like good Christmas music. Like if you had to pick, uh, I, and I don't mean like good, good, I mean like- Like Muppets good. Muppets good. <laughs> um, they're like the really old 1950s Christmas music mm -hmm. before the Mariah Carey's, mm -hmm. before all of the other covers that became famous. They were just like gross I feel like, grandma. Yeah, for me, it's kind of the Christmas music you hear when you're stuck in winter traffic versus yeah. the kind of Christmas music you're listening to when you're driving around looking at the lights. Exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's just, it was, uh, it was kind of gross. But um, the other thing too was some of the Australian slang that we're just not used to. Um, they were they were throwing some slang around, and it was it was interesting just to be like, what? What did? Oh, I like some the of food, them. I like the food one again. The spag bowl. Spag bowl, <laughs> which yeah, there was it was uh, Vicky and her mom, and her mom's like, oh, I made spag bowl. Don't you like it or something like that? And yeah, it was a British accent. <laughs> Close. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we were trying to. We were both. I could tell. Like we were both thinking about what the spag fuck is bowl? spag bowl? Like I've never heard of that dish. And then I saw they're eating. Spaghetti, and I was like, okay, it's spaghetti bolognese. You got it. You got it. Mm. I, it's like their slang is, it's not like it's crazy. It just takes a second. You're like, yeah. Oh, I mean, that makes, I guess that makes sense. The other thing we wanted to note too was um, the obscenely high door handles in every house. I do, okay, I've never been to Australia. Nope. Is that a thing? The door handles, I thought in certain scenes that the people were on their knees facing a door and the mm -hmm. door handles like above their head and i was like why the fuck are they crawling on their knees what are they doing and then nope that's just where the door handle is on like your bedroom door they just like uh the feeling of like being a toddler again where you just have to like reach to open up a door <laughs> it's, so weird. it's it's really weird for me being a six foot four uh tall person a tall man um you could poke your eye out i would i would love it it'd be great I'm tired of door handles that are just like so low or or countertops that are way too low. You're just a freak. Just a waste of time. You're too and tall. it hurts my back. I don't need that. Um, You're really bending down a lot yes. to open a door. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> it's weird. I don't go through those doors anymore. Well, I'm 5'5", five five, so the world is yeah, right with me. <laughs> I'm almost a foot I taller am than you. perfectly average. Well, that's great. <laughs> and I'm not. The, uh, oh. So, um, essentially, she gets... She gets caught and then they have her chained up to a bedpost, which at first I, I just didn't really pay attention to it. Then after a while, I was trying to think, I was thinking about it a little bit more and I'm like, I mean, it's not that hard to like some of the pieces she could just slide up and over because of the pegs of the bed frame that she's on. It was interesting. It looked like they just wrapped the chain around the bedposts mm -hmm. that weren't connected fully to the top of the bed. So it looked like she could just slip the chains right off, yep. but I'm pretty sure they were wrapped around. I think it was one long chain. So I'm pretty sure it was wrapped around. Still like even when she like at night kind of or something lazy, like yeah. that, like when they're asleep, try to, because there were, there were some loops where in, they even showed the time that she tried doing it and she did get it one over. Mm -hmm. They're just loops that are looping it around this wrapped one. Around. When I'm saying a peg, I mean like the top is open. It's not looped into itself. So I don't think it's too crazy to think that she could have loosened it up, unlooped that, and then loosen up other things. And then she essentially is close to just like even being free. Um, well, she, it, at, you know, at the very least she has more room with the chain. But maybe, I, I don't know if that was an intentional thing that they wanted to do to just show the audience and like look, how home, close. Like, look at how close she is. Because there are a lot of moments where she is so close to escaping oh, yeah. and she doesn't. Before we get into that too, I feel like I say that for everything that we have. We get it ahead might of just, ourselves. We're I just, very excited. Yeah. I just, I have my notes in the wrong place and it's messing everything up. Oh, um, so this is your fault. This is my fault and yours. No. So I, uh, I like the attention to detail too with um, how like, there's pieces in the house 
that are very, they're all lined up with each other. So there's like cigarette buds that are all lined up. There's beer bottles. It feels very, like someone in the house has OCD. Exactly. And I think we know which person does. Which person? It's John. Yep. So the serial killer. Uh, so I liked some of that. And they didn't, I don't think they were very blunt with it. Although there were, I guess there were a couple shots where they literally, they that's what they show. On it. So they, they did that. And then, um, yeah, going back to just her being chained up. There was a scene with her and Evelyn, and Evelyn was basically just talking with her and cleaning her sheets. And there was just multiple times where you're just like, just, just do something, just do something. She doesn't it's have anything so, on I her. I know, but it's so it's so easy to say that. No, I know because I can say that though. It's a I'm, movie. No, but I do the same thing where I'm screaming like, oh my gosh, just like strangle her with yeah. a chain or kick her in the gut or whatever. But I keep having to remind myself that you would be fucking terrified oh no i'm sure you would be paralyzed with fear and especially like a young girl too like i would be oh my gosh so but no i do the exact same thing where i'm like just do, God, i think there's a one point more to scream a little bit louder yeah I, I don't know i just think there's a point in which you just like i'm willing to take this bet because i think she knew at that point she knew that john was out of the house it was just them too and then there was other shots where it's just her yeah but at that point she thought she was just there for ransom yeah i guess so mm-hmm. but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, and plus, I just think I think there was too many scenes where Evelyn just gives her way too much freedom um, to the point where, like, it didn't show if she was armed either. There was one point where she walks over and grabs the knife and then she uses it every time she needs to get her back into the room. But to me, I, she she was just like, don't do it. And then to me, I'm like, or what? We haven't seen anything yet. So I. I I, but I mean, like it's it shows what happened at the end of the movie too. Mm-hmm. So I I don't, I don't think that's too crazy to to think you know like I don't see her doing anything and she's not so far, and then at the end it shows that she didn't and yeah, couldn't but not to her. No, yeah, but I think the whole thing is is that it's you have to again put yourself in just like you were saying how the shots of like the slow motion maybe mm-hmm. you're trying to put yourself in vicky's shoes where it's like you have to again put yourself in vicky's shoes because at that point again she said or she thought that they were just going to take her for ransom and so in her i'm sure in her mind she's probably thinking if i just comply and i don't like fuck with them and i just do what they say they'll get their money i'll be good and then once things completely turn then you're also questioning these people are fucking nuts i don't know what they could do to me and it to well, I mean, and I, I know it like it it, yeah. it changes too because she has her write a new note mm-hmm. or tells her to write a new note too. So um, and at that yeah, and at the second note, clearly Vicky knows right what's what's um, going to go down. Yeah. Um. So all while all this is happening, her mom and her dad are talking to each other, and the the parents are in the midst of a Recent, divorce. Yeah, just recently separated, and they're talking to each other and trying to figure out what happened, but. At the same time, the dad is just like he acts like a teenager. He acts like a teenager. He he's like uh, trying to get back with her. At the same time, too, he figures this is a good time to get back with the, the, mo- uh, the mom. Maggie. Yeah, because the mom had left the dad, and before Vicky ends up sneaking out of the house, she has a fight with her mom in a very kind of typical teenage fashion. And like this is all your fault and you you know broke up he this said, marriage I, and yeah. then in the later scene you see the dad basically say the same thing and be like i can understand why vicky doesn't want to live here and storms out after yep. he tries being like let's make it work our daughter's still missing but let's make it work i can see why vicky isn't here exactly and I'm, it's just first of all you have bigger things to worry about now that was not the time to try and reconcile mm-hmm. and then you're putting that on the mom fuck you exactly. i can see why she left <laughs> Guy's a douche, um, but he's rich. It's probably a bigger douche then. Probably. So I, I guess we can talk about the one scene that um, absolutely just shattered us. Um, <laughs> so during while this movie is happening um, and she's being tortured, there's a dog that they have and that they own um, and that we learn that um, they have this dog in replace of her kids coming back. Evelyn's Evelyn has you see that Evelyn, um, the one of the abductors, she has kids. She has mm-hmm. small kids, and it's clear that she isn't allowed to see them. Right. And it's also clear that she wants them back. Yep. So she very and there are also moments where she's staring at babies, and you can tell that's really what is a big motivator mm-hmm. for her. And we find out that this dog was given to her 
somewhat to replace her kids so John doesn't have to deal with that shit. All he has to do is just give her a dog and she'll shut up. Right. And you know John doesn't care at all about anything. He doesn't care about anything except for his Him. wants and desires. Yep. And if he can just say, I'm sorry, after hitting her and then giving her a dog so he doesn't have to see her kids, mm -hmm. he's going to do it. That's it. Um, and obviously, too, you, you see during this movie, too, that he is completely manipulating um, her and her emotions and how she acts and he's, telling what to do. Yep, and, he's an abuser on every level. All levels. Um, and even gets into the, and I, I think that it's more implied that he drove her away from her own family, too, because he was saying, like, I got you away from that, that, I don't even know what word he used, like, dumbass Nikki or Nick. <laughs> Mick. Mick. Um, which I assume was his, he said his father, too, but I assumed, like, Mick was also his John, brother yeah, John brings up three different moments where he was Evelyn's knight in shining mm -hmm. armor with one of her exes, her dad, and then her the father of her children, Nick. Mm, and he right. basically says, like, remember when I protected you from these guys? So it's clear that Evelyn has a pattern of being with yep. abusers, and you can assume that it started with her father. But – and that sometimes that is a way where abusers worm their way into people's lives where it's like, oh, this guy's treating you so bad. I'll mm -hmm. help you with him. Come with me. And then you go with that person and then that person's just as bad, if not worse. Right. So it's it could be very real where he did protect her in these moments, but he's still an abuser. Exactly. Um <laughs> So all of this kind of leads to a scene in which um, the worst. Scene. It's the worst scene. So the she likes bringing in the dog Lou, um, and Lou keeps using the Lou um, all over the floor, and Lou, Lou keeps shitting on the carpet. Lou shits on the carpet, everyone. And uh, there's a scene in which John just like completely had it. He yells at Lou, tells Lou to get out. Lou is just like, it's just a scared dog. And Lou's just like, oh shit. Lulu. Lou. Lulu. Lulu. Oh, it's Lulu. <laughs> Lulu. Why didn't you say something? <laughs> I did earlier. I said Lulu. I don't, I didn't hear that. Yeah, I know. So, um, anyways, he, uh, Lulu runs away into the kitchen. John is just like, he's, he's at his limit at that point. And he runs in and then completely just stomps the dog um, to death. He kicks the dog to death because the dog didn't go outside and there have been multiple scenes where the dog is let in and goes to the bathroom on the carpet and John hates the dog and he hates when things are out of place or dirty. Again, like we said, he's the one with OCD. So he kills the dog in the kitchen and you hear the whimpering and you hear the kicking and it is so upsetting. Mm -hmm. I absolutely hated that. We said after that scene was done that we have to give Honey... The, all the hugs she deserves she i like that she after us watching a movie she is rewarded with hugs. she reaps the benefits yeah um i i wrote down i'm like i hate the dog scene as it was happening mm -hmm. and then i said i absolutely loathe it and honestly this makes me not want to watch the movie knowing that this part is I hate, I like abs, watching yep. it again mm -hmm. the rewatchability is like fast forward through that i wouldn't i would skip that part again. right and then i said make it a note to hug honey after this <laughs> um so everything kind of just uh, compiles and every, like I would say the relationship themselves itself kind of implodes. Well, especially um, after that scene, because Evelyn, who treats Lulu as her baby, mm -hmm. she comes in and finds John murdering her dog and yeah. she tries to pull him off and she like falls apart on the floor crying. So she, this he is hit a, her on the, he yeah, he, her. well, he hits her and then she just like stays on the floor yeah. screaming. So this is a very big part for them where he has now just murdered the one thing that she has directly in her life mm -hmm. that she loves. Um, so, uh, I, I guess the, the scenes that come to follow to Vicky's parents find out, uh, where she is because, so the a letter was also sent to there was to her boyfriend. So Vicky's forced to write a letter to her mom when she first gets abducted, saying, "I've moved to Adelaide and I've started a new job. I found a new boyfriend." And earlier in the movie, when Vicky is with her boyfriend after school, you can see them writing, and she writes kind of this hidden message to him on this piece of paper. And he's supposed to, it's kind of like a game that they have where he's supposed to figure out what she actually is writing in between the words and the lines mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So she 
obviously uses that in the letter that she's writing the first round and she it's addressed to her mom and she writes a note at the end of the letter you have to show this to jay because i'm so sorry i'm leaving him for another man Mm. kind of a thing she's able to get that out and her mom does end up showing it to her boyfriend they figure out the street that she's on Mm -hmm. but it's the wrong address it's the wrong address it's the address across the street some old lady because evelyn steals everyone else's mail and the letter that vicky saw on the countertop the address was wrong it was their neighbor yep um and they're known to be to steal um letters and other people's mail and um I, i there was one scene too where you see mailboxes and they're like outside on the street corner and the mail is just kind of sticking out yeah, for anyone to take. I mean, you can still do the like. What's stopping you from taking it out of a mailbox? Just a little metal door. But yeah, it's very- it's literally sticking out though. They're open Same. boxes and it's sticking out. It's birth. It's birth. Um, so the the parents and um, the boyfriend they go to the street. They go to the old lady across the street. She has no idea what's going on, and the mom is is livid, obviously. Well, also um, because the fucking police. They go to the police, oh and the police do the very standard thing of, oh well, she's a runaway. Ninety nine percent of me. this, it's a runaway. She'll come back. She's just going through teenage shit. Trust me, I'm a police it's officer. Woman I know. <laughs> it's woman trouble. It's woman trouble. Um. Yeah. I, I. The police are just like insanely incompetent during this, <laughs> this whole movie. It's like but it's that like a was, joke. That was a lot of. That's a lot of the mindset that police had. I think, oh especially in the eighties, when kids would go missing. Oh, they're just runaways. They'll come back. They're going through a phase. And she said, like, someone has her, and he's like, no one's got her. And you're like, what are you saying? Um. So they make it to that to the street. They're are, knocking on doors. They're knocking on doors. The they're screaming. Screaming her name. You're screaming outside. her name. Um, they, there's a point in which Evelyn is trying to, she's, she's tasked by John to kill Vicky finally. And she, rather than stabbing her, she has her to, uh, she instructs her to just essentially just eat sleeping pills, uh, a whole bottle, um, which is a callback to the sleeping pill, uh, kind of fact that we had in the beginning where she, uh, reads the, the name the of the true chapter. story, yeah. Um, and uh, she, while doing so, the drug dealer, there's a drug dealer, dealer whole like thing with John where he owes him money. And it's he's it's one it's one of those scenes where you cut to the mom banging on doors yeah. and then inside the captor's house, you hear knocking. And so it kind of cuts back and forth. And so you there's a part of you that really wants this to be the mom knocking on the right it's door. But so you tense. know it's not. Yeah. You know it's like, you know it's not going to be that simple. And it's just some random person that was from earlier on in the movie, mm-hmm. like a neighbor or something, just calling on John to get some money. But I mean, that that scene in general, that was super tense. Oh. Um, and it got even more tense once she could hear her mom screaming her name and asking where she is. And then you see this whole thing between her and Evelyn where Evelyn's like, you can Evelyn's see it in her face. Evelyn's holding her up against the yep. wall, covered. So they're eye to eye. And you can see Vicky, like you can see all of, like the, all the communication happening yep. between the two of them without any words being spoken while John's at the front door. And you can hear Vicky's mom in the background. Yeah. And so it's, yeah, it's a very it's tense a really moment. because, And that was a scene where the whole time I'm like, kick her in the gut, yeah. kick her in the gut. But Evelyn, can, Evelyn but has a knife right exactly. to her throat. Um, but yeah, so it's just, it's one of those things where it's like, uh, it's so frustrating because you don't, and you want Evelyn to, there's a moment where you think she's going to break when she's holding I thought Vicky. she was just going to let yeah, her go. Yeah, where you think like, okay, Vicky's clearly pleading with her and Evelyn is, because she's hearing Vicky's mom say, I just want my daughter. Mm-hmm. And so that's a very like soft point for Evelyn as a mom who wants her kids where so you can see there's like just this little kind of crack in the veneer for her and you're thinking like okay Evelyn's gonna crack Evelyn, like she's gonna let her go doesn't happen and then the door closes and I just oh my gosh I was so upset when the door yep. closed because the whole time I'm thinking that's it that's, that's we're it. done yep so uh the scene after that is her telling her to finish the pills to which this is where she stands up and she says, no, just stab me. Just do it. Because at that point, she knows that she's not going to actually, she she can't do it. Like John, John can, but she knows that she can't. So she's telling her to do it and she just can't. So then John hears this. He comes over 
and then he tries to strangle her himself. Tries to strangle Vicky. Right. Um, on the on the floor, to which Evelyn still has the knife, and then she comes over and stabs John once. And at this point, he's he's like, what? What just happened to me? Um, well, I think, too, what's interesting in the movie is there are a number of times where Evelyn's very upset because she feels like John is gravitating towards Vicky and she is scared that John like has this infatuation and this almost love for Vicky over her and she is getting in her own head mm-hmm. and then she has Vicky telling her that John's just using you all this stuff and so there are a few moments where Evelyn reaches a boiling point and holds a knife to her own throat mm-hmm. as a threat to John and right. saying I'm going to kill myself and he doesn't he doesn't give a fuck and so that I think is a very interesting moment she never threatens John she always threatens herself right and so it's very, she doesn't ever want to hurt John. So this is the first time so this she is the hurts first him. first time she hurts him. Um, so she does that initial stab. He's, he's just kind of shocked. And then she ends up doing a bunch of other stabs. And they're pretty brutal. Those stab, that stab scene was pretty brutal. Um, they weren't just like really quick stabs. They were slower and they specifically cut to um, the spot where you see her stab and mm-hmm. you see that there's um, some kind of give to it. Mm-hmm. So it's, it was particularly yeah, it was pretty, pretty good, brutal. Yeah. Um, I I think with some of the scenes in this movie, I wouldn't have a problem titling it as a horror movie though. It's not titled as it, or the it's not it doesn't have horror within mm-hmm. it. But I don't I wouldn't see a problem. There's a couple scenes where I'm like that's pretty eerie. Um, there are terrifying. Scenes. Yeah, it's terrifying because I think a it there if this guy is basing it off of what actually happened in Perth that is a horrifying story in and of itself. And the fact that, like, you know, the fact that he's using those stories, those real-life stories to create this movie, that's terrifying to know that there are people out there that can do that. Mm -hmm. That I don't give a shit about ghosts and ghouls. (laughs) That doesn't keep me up at night. You don't think that's spooky? Mm Mm-mm. If Um, I'm having a knife by my bed, it's because of those people, not because of poltergeist. It's the real people that are the scariest. (laughs) Um, And so, essentially, after that, she... She escapes and then um, catches up to her mom and dad and boyfriend I, who just happened to be driving really slow. Well, they're driving away. it because they're just finished it. Like the car passes as she takes Vicky's her time outside. getting back in the car. And, and I, I get it. Like well, she thought she had a lead. You thought you have. Yeah. You think you have found this, your daughter and she's being held. And after screaming your guts up, <laughs> she, yeah, she gets in the mom gets in the car very slowly. But, um, yeah, it's. I didn't like that scene because they're base. They're at the end of the street, and the mom looks in the rearview mirror, and mm-hmm. she sees Vicky kind of stumbling down the street, and the mom stops the car, gets out, and she, there's this moment where the camera just focuses on the mom, and she's running in slow motion. And mm-hmm. I hated it. It that was With a some very, of the music. I can't remember what the music was, but it was like walking on air or something like that. <laughs> I'm walking on sunshine. sunshine. <laughs> yeah, um, but. Yeah, I didn't like that moment where they focused on... And then it was really just like one shot where they focused on the mom running in slow motion. I didn't like that. And then... You know that they they were just like, oh, it's been so long. We just want... Like, they're yeah. like, the audience just wants to see them hug. Let's stretch it out. It, I just... Yeah, I didn't like that part. And then when the mom actually embraces Vicky, the mom's face seems off to me. In what way? I just... Don't think that there was enough relief, and there wasn't enough emotion. I want, I you okay. know, yeah. I I just don't. I don't know. I think after we're feeling it. Well, after your daughter's been missing, she's clearly been abducted sh- to the point where she's giving you a hint in a note that says, "I've run away," mm-hmm. and you know, nope, that's not the case. Something's happening. She's under duress or something, and then she comes out in a man's shirt completely beaten to a pulp staggering down without any pants down a street and i don't know i what just what was the face she was giving it almost what did just, it read like it almost looked you? like she was just she was hugging her daughter after they got into a big fight and she picked her daughter up from you know getting a dui right from jail or something like that that's what it looked like where they were I like call you. it was kind of like Oh, we're, you know what? We had a fight. You got in trouble, but we're here. We're together and it's fine. Not my daughter was 
abducted abducted and tortured in right. the most brutal way and now i have her <laughs> i just i would have expected more contortion in the face well let's send that actress a note and let her know but i'm not going to write it directly it i'm just going to kind of write it in a secret I'll way i'll write it and i'll just say se so sentiments from jessica every third oh, word you. the first letter in that word will end up spelling out fix your face <laughs> I'm sure she'll take it to heart. Um, the other uh, kind of last note I have is uh, when they offered her a stick of uh, the weed, mm. um, they said it was $10 Australian. And I guess... $10 Australian. Yeah. And in Australia, a stick is usually $20 and contains 1 to 1. 1.5 grams. Mm. Is that a hefty stick? 10 bucks. Well, if it's usually 20 and a couple in the middle of the night in a bad part of town pulls up and says, hey, do you want it for 10 while you come back to my house and we'll get it? There's no fucking way. No. 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 I... Uh, you what? I questioned my own dealer when he dropped his prices. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I do too. <laughs> With that said, let's jump into the IMDb reviews. How about that? How's that feel? Yeah. Okay. Um, so what would you guess uh, the IMDb reviews, um, what would you say the, the average rating is for this movie? Six. Solid six? <laughs> okay. Um, so within our age bracket, um, male is 6.7 and female is 6.5. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So the first review says <clears throat> couple of monsters, eight out of 10. Mm-hmm. Great movie about horis horrific stuff. There you go. Evelyn and John cruise Perth schoolyards, fish for teenage girls with friendly Aussie banter and car ride offers. The pleasantries end right there. As a secret predator couple in the neighborhood, Emma Booth and Stephen Curry are spectacular in their complicated performance. Uh, charming, uh, slick and methodical, brutal and sad sadistic, sadistic. Uh, vulnerable and suspicious. All bases are covered. Hounds of Love is about a serial sexual homicide, and it is a brutal and it is as brutal as it sounds. Not in an exploitive manner, but in its believable depiction of perversion and the matter of fact execution by the monsters. Mm -hmm. Sporting a cheesy mustache, Curry presents a tiny, unassuming wimp. He is humiliated and berated about owing money. Uh, yet deep inside, he is a tight wound ball of explosion yeah. and the creepy manipulator of all the crimes. Evelyn is more than willing uh, accomplice, but she has a wounded past, shows some semblance of sympathy, and is thus the weak link in the monster couple. How all this plays out in the recent triangle is expertly framed by newbie filmmaker Ben Young. Hounds of Love is difficult to watch, but is also difficult to ignore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think there's really. I don't. I don't have any arguments. It's with interesting. That yeah, this review is like very matter of fact. I'm mm -hmm. like, yep, yeah, I, I guess so. I'm not sure. I. I don't know. I don't know if I was coming in to read it. I guess. I guess it's helpful. Um, that explains the movie. Yeah. Uh, so review two. Hmm. What is the point? What? Two out of ten. <laughs> I haven't been desperately looking for decent thrillers, and every time it is the same thing. If I don't stop myself, I can find myself coming back here and write the same review over and over again. This time, it's about a codependent couple who kidnap and kill young girls. There is some story. Of, there is some story about their own woman's children, but it's not very clear. It's are, not very clear. Are they gone? You, Taken by social services? A fucking idiot. <laughs> who cares if we get away with half-ass explanations? This is the time for you to say what you feel, Jessica. I hate this person. This person. And it, the fact that they're saying, like, I'm writing the same review over and over again. You don't understand movies. I'm sorry. They're trying their best. Try a book. <laughs> Try harder. Try Dr. Seuss. The man is a psychotic asshole, a complete loser who is pushed around in real life. So he takes great care of exercising his power on his girlfriend and other women. That's an accurate yeah. statement. The girlfriend is a self hating person with dependency issues probably had an abusive father or something yep 
Mm -hmm. The girl they kidnapped comes from an almost broken family. For some reason, the mother left the father to do her own thing. But there is no much explanation there either. There is no much. There is no much. The girl is a smart one. (laughs) Talking about male-female power relations relate novels with her boyfriend. Okay, this can seem a bit too easy to follow, but at least there is a structure there. And unfortunately, all the rest is billed on this and nothing more is added to the character development to the story. Was that it? Is that done? No, it's not done. They kidnap the girl. They torture her. The girl finds a way to squeeze in some unsettling ideas into the woman's head. He is only using you, she tells her to her kidnapper about the asshole. (laughs) On the other hand, the girl's mother is looking for her despite the unbelievable disinterest and laid back attitude of the police officers. Yes, that's that's true. Yep. Uh, although there is a girl kidnapped and vanished regularly at in this time, I'm not sure if this would happen in New York. Well, there are notes left. Maybe all of these kidnapped girls are forced to write a note about how they are gone to Adelaide. They all go to Adelaide. They all go to Adelaide. <laughs> I do. I do. That was something that I pointed out when we were watching yeah. the movie where the police officers... The dad looks at like the missing persons. There's a bunch of young girls, and he's like, "What about those other girls? Like that? Th- there's clearly something going on." And the he's officer like, nah. is like, "They're all runaways." <laughs> That's like it, the fact that you can say "all" yeah. as a qualifier. Yeah. No, it shouldn't. It should be one or two, maybe. But if you're saying "all,", all. that's there's you got wrong. an issue. <laughs> Something's wrong there. Um. Anyway. The real problem is the fact that the movie tries to build something on the codependency situation between the psycho couple and how the young victim would try to navigate this wound to get her ass out of there. The idea is good, but it requires so much knowledge about human psychology and much deeper dialogue that has yet to be achieved. This instead looks like a student project with lots of easy dialogue explanatory uh, shots that spoon feeds everything to the audience. Wait, I'm sorry. So were they saying that there's too many like psychological references or terms or, or, or situations that aren't explained, but are exp- I'm confused. Yes. Oh. Okay. So not enough, but too much. Yeah. Okay. It's like, tell me more, but stop telling me <laughs> but shut what up. you just told me. <laughs> there is no point to the story. The kid, they kidnap the girl. The psycho girlfriend gets jealous of her. Why? And she Why? somehow manipulates the the psycho girlfriend. And right about the psycho boyfriend was about to kill the victim. And I, I said right about, I meant right about because that is what, what they wrote. Right about the psycho boyfriend who was about to kill the victim, the psycho girlfriend kills him and the victim is free to go. What happened? Why? Is it the fact that the asshole killed her dog? <laughs> Codependent couple stories are elegant, elegantly handled in so many cases californication natural born killers <laughs> sid and nancy etc <Okay. laughs> pointless violence is explored so successfully in so many examples like the american crime funny games etc i don't know these so i know funny games you do? that's a good one we should watch that so please just do some little do some little effort if you're going to try to measure up to these People got so lazy. Okay, I just want to be clear. So is this person saying that they're not living up to funny games? Yes. And they're saying that this was a pointless story? And they said it was lazy. Okay. Well, just looking at funny games, (laughs) it's just about two psychos. And there's clearly a dominant and a submissive. And all they do is torture and kill a family and then move on to the next. And the cycle starts over. They both kill? Yeah, they're both they're both in on it. Mm. There's clearly a dominant and a submissive in the relationship, and all they do is just psychologically torture and physically torture a family. And then li- the, the way they start, they introduce themselves to this family that they kill in the movie. That's how they introduce themselves to the next family at the very end. So that is, if you're talking about pointless violence, it's a good movie. I like it. I will okay. recommend it. Pointless violence and a movie that repeats itself. But what's the point? You're telling a story. I don't know. Entertainment. <laughs> That's the point. Well, let's see if review number three has let's go to review number three. has their shit together. Review number three. Not seeing it. Oh. Two out of ten. 
The positive reviews. The movie itself isn't poorly done. It's professional. The acting is solid. The film is quality. There is no, there are no mistakes that catch the eye, but it also really doesn't go anywhere. I'm not sure what the entertaining part of this movie was supposed to be. There's no real suspense to speak of. <laughs> I just like watching your reactions. <laughs> This is why we need a camera just to get, get your face. <laughs> you know, I suppose if you stretch, if you stretched, you could say there was some psychological intrigue, but not even to make you think about anything worthwhile. Let that sink in. I didn't I didn't develop any attachment to the characters, no real love for the victim, nor overwhelming hatred of the scumbags. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't like hate these guys. I don't hate the serial killer, serial rapists. Like they're fine, I guess. They're okay. They had a dog. Had they had a, a dog. They... <laughs> Their house was clean. They did a lot of laundry. <laughs> the movie just kind of tells this story in a pretty bland way, and then ends. Waste of time. IMO. You stupid. <laughs> So that is what we got for the reviews, the IMDb reviews. What did you think of that? No. Great. <laughs> Let's go into our final reviews. Jessica, what is your final review for Hounds of Love? Rewatchability. For me, it's not there. But I thought it was well done. I thought the performances were really good. And I was interested in the whole story. There wasn't a part where I thought it was moving too slow or I was bored. So... For me, I would probably rate it 6.2. 6.2? Yeah. All right. Once again, I mean, while you were trying to figure that out, if you noticed I was typing, yeah. just to show mm -hmm. what my... I gave it a 6.3. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I agree. I, I, I think the movie was um, put together really well. Mm -hmm. I think the acting was really good. Mm -hmm. Really raw, really gritty. Um, I think they did a great job portraying even the victims at times mm -hmm. in certain situations. I think there were some scenes that were just like, okay, it's very convenient that this happened, this happened. Yeah. And as we know, we can't say, well, it's based on a true story because it's not the whole thing that happened wasn't based on one story. It was an amalgamation of mm -hmm. other stories together too. Um, but I... I other than the dog scene, which I know dog scene is, is terrible. that was really bad to watch. But again, they and I really do appreciate this about um, this movie is that they didn't show because I am not a fan of oh, gore. Yeah. I don't like gore for gore's sake. I can take like stabbings mm -hmm. and you know I like there. I can take it up to a certain point, but then once you're past that point, it's literally just torture porn. Yep. And I don't. They didn't have any scenes of them murdering the dog, which I really appreciate. Mm -hmm. and it's all I off think, camera. Mm -hmm, and I think they didn't just have these frivolous rape scenes, mm -hmm. which I think a lot of movies do. They, they, don't they need implied it. Yeah. a lot. And, and there was enough terror for me in the the scenes that they mm -hmm. did have that it did the job. Yeah. And and you know how like I think about certain things like that too, where I'm like, you don't have to show that. You mm -hmm. can just imply it. Yeah. And I, I still think that's just as powerful, if not even more powerful than actually showing something happening. Um, I think it obviously depends on the context of what's happening and yeah. when it happens, but I think they did a good job at that as well. Mm -hmm. So that is that is it for this week's show. Um, thank you for joining us. Make sure to follow our social channels. We're still finding our way out there when it comes to the social media scene, especially within podcasts. So thank you for listening and uh, watch our social channels to find out what the next will be. Um, what hopefully, next spooky spin we'll have. oh man, hopefully it's something super spooky and well, we have Halloween coming up this week. Halloween is so. coming up. So I'm hoping we, we just get a banger. We, we get like the perfect Halloween movie. Hell yeah. Um, so with that said, thanks for listening and sign us out, Jessica. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Give me some time to blow them down. I'm a deep water sailor just in from Hong Kong. Give me way, blow the man down. Give me some ground.